I'm going to start off by talking about springs, ideal springs. Now you might wonder why I talk about ideal springs for contact forces, but it turns out the ideal spring is a simple mathematical model that we actually apply to lots of contact forces, in particular normal force and tension. Now ideal springs don't really exist, but if one existed it would look something like this. It's an open spring with the wires not touching. Now for an ideal spring, it has its natural length, which is what we're seeing here, what's that, about six or seven centimetres. If you try and squash it below the ideal length, it pushes back. So it's trying to push back against my hand. If I try and pull it beyond the ideal length, it pulls inwards. So what you calculate for these things is you look at whatever the change is from the ideal length. There'll be some ideal length, it's natural unstressed length, and if you make it less than that by an amount x, there'll be a force that pushes back, and the more you take it away from its ideal length, the stronger that force is. Likewise, if you put it the other way, so you're making an extension this way, there'll be a force that way. So the equation we use is that the force is proportional to how far it's extended from the ideal length, but acts in the opposite direction. So if you put it out, the extension is this way, the force is that way. If you push it in, the extension is this way, the force is that way. So let's look at the maths of an ideal spring. So here we have our spring, unstressed. So when it's unstressed, it'll have some natural length L. But let's say we compress it. So now it's shorter than L. We've compressed it by an amount x from the natural length. Or let's say we stretch it. It's now been extended by distance x from the natural length. Now for an ideal spring, that fictitious thing, the equation is that the force, which is a vector, is equal to minus a constant called the spring constant times the vector x, which is the extension, how far it's been moved from its natural length. So if x is positive, the force is negative. If, so if you pull it out, the force pushes back, and vice versa. We can plot a graph the force, to be precise, the x component of the force, as a function of the extension x. If it's not stretched at all, it's zero. If we pull it outwards, the force becomes more and more negative, and if you push it in, the force becomes more and more positive. Now, of course, ideal springs like this don't really exist. If you push it so too much in, the different wire loops start touching each other and the force becomes much bigger. If you pull it out too much it probably breaks and the force goes to zero. But that gives us a rough idea and it's probably a good approximation valid for reasonably small extension. Okay, so that's the force. We can also look at the energy. And to do this we're going to use the concept of work. How much energy do you put in if you stretch or compress a spring? Now we know the amount of work done is equal to the force times the distance. But as you push this out, the force is constantly changing. So when things are constantly changing, you need calculus. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a spring at zero, and we're going to move it a little way out, and work out the little bit of distance here, the delta x times the force which is going to be quite small. And then we're going to move out another little bit, and there's going to be another delta x times the force, which is a bit bigger. We're going to add them all up to work out the total amount of work needed to stretch the spring out to a particular distance d. So we're adding up lots of little f time dx. And that's called an integral. So the total energy is going to be the integral, starting from extension 0, out to our full extension d of the force times the extension. That's just adding up the amount of work needed a little bit, each little bit. Now the force 
is minus k times x, so it's the integral of minus kx dx, which is going to be minus a half kx squared from naught to d, which is equal to one half k d squared. So that's the amount of work it takes you to compress a spring by that amount. So it's the amount of energy that's gone into the spring. So we have the two fundamental equations for springs. We have that the force equals minus k times the extension. And the energy put in is equal to a half times the spring constant times how much you've compressed it or stretched it squared. Now, do ideal springs really exist? Well, if you push this in or out a little bit, it behaves pretty much like an ideal spring. But if I squash it all the way till the metal is flat, then suddenly I can't push it in any further. Likewise, if I pull it too much, which I'm not going to demonstrate, it might actually break or deform. So most springs, open springs like this, are fairly close to ideal springs if you're only squashing them a little bit or pulling them out a little bit, but push them in or out too much and they cease to behave like it. Many springs, however, are only like it in one direction. Take a spring like this. If you pull it down, it behaves like an ideal spring for a while, but if you push it up, it just goes all floppy. So this is behaves like an ideal spring only for extension and not for compression. Elastic is a bit like that as well. So likewise, elastic, if you pull it, it pushes back, so it behaves somewhat like an ideal spring. If you push it, once again, it goes all floppy. So again, behaving half like an ideal spring. Though in fact, for elastic, if you pull it too much, at some point it goes rigid when the fabric goes tight, and then it becomes much harder to push. So do ideal springs exist? Not really. They're often a good approximation for small amounts of motion. We use them as approximations in many other cases. For example, as a model for chemical bonds, uh, when you lean on a wall or on a table or something like that, or push hands against each other. We often model it as an ideal spring, uh, but it's only a rough approximation.